Uh, my name is Kent Weir. I'm here to talk to you about an introduction to API management. And as you can see, there's a, a part one tag associated with this. And the reason for that is that part two is going to be covered by Tommaso. So first off, a little bit about myself. So I've been doing BizTalk for quite some time. I've co-authored a few books with some people in the room. Um, integration pro MVP program, I've been in there for quite some time. And as Johan alluded to, I am the only person here from Canada. But evidently, I'm not the only person who cheers for Team Canada. So. <laughs> Now, API is a very loaded term. I think probably going back to your schooling days, you've heard the term API. And so what is this new phenomenon of API management? So an API in its simplest terms is an application programming interface, or API, that has a set of requirements that enables one application to talk to another application. So an analogy that I like to think of is some doors to a building. If I have an office building or a business and I want to allow customers to come in to either buy goods or services, they're going to come in through a door. Now there's many different types of doors. I might be able to pull a door, push a door, use a revolving door or a sliding door, but it's really is the door in which a customer will interact with my business. And I really see an API as being no different in the sense that I might have a set of software services or a piece of software, and I want to allow other consumers to use this software, and therefore they're going to go through an API. Now, what is a web API? So, similar in nature, but have a prescribed implementation. This implementation would include HTTP or HTTPS, and they tend to be RESTful-ish. And for some of the reasons Charles decided not to go too far down this path, I'm not going to either. But for this presentation, let's think of it as we are going to use actions that, or verbs that belong to the HTTP pro protocol to perform operations against different resources. And in this case, we're going to use things like HTTP GET, PUT, POST, PATCH, and DELETE. Earlier this morning, Steph Jan talked about JSON. And JSON typically is a first-class citizen of APIs, but we also have XML. So generally, when using APIs, the preference is JSON, but we can also specify XML as a content type, and that service should also expose it for us as well. More recently, we've started to see spec-driven development and how it relates to APIs. We saw yesterday Swagger in Samir's presentation where he used a code-first approach to spec-driven development in the sense he went and constructed his ASP.NET Web API or his uh, API app API and was able to use Swashbuckle to expose that metadata as Swagger. The, in contrast, we also have design-first or what I like to call contract-first where we would go ahead and model out our API using something like RAML or Swagger and then be able to use that definition to generate code or scaffold out some, some workflows. So either approach is acceptable, and these are things that you will typically see related to APIs. So briefly, just want to talk about the API economy and the different pillars that make up the API economy. So first off, we have ISVs. who are going to be building software or software services that expose APIs and allow us as developers to interact with them. So an example of this would be Salesforce, where they have a rich API and they expose their CRM platform, where we can manipulate different entities like customers or opportunities and leads and perform operations against those different entities. Next, we have new channels. And these are opportunities that emerge as a result of an API being introduced. So consider some existing back office processes where you have an agent involved and the customer talks to the agent. You want to now expose these as mobile APIs and introduce new channels. Uh, that would be another example. And later on in my demo, I'll show how we go from a traditional auto insurance quoting process and we want to mobilize this and introduce new sources of revenue and channels. Next is marketing and customer relationships. 
And I always find this a little bit interesting if you're following, if you're on Twitter, and I'm a big Twitter user, big Twitter fan, and you'll see people complaining, and it's usually about their airline. And what's interesting is how they will get responses back from the airline. And the airline isn't sitting on Twitter all day, right? They are using different APIs to consume customer sentiment, usually loading it into their CRM system, and then managing it through workflow. So this is another example of APIs have changed the way organizations manage and deal with their customers. Another pillar of the API economy is security. And like most things, there's no silver bullet when it comes to API and security, but we're starting to see some recognizable patterns in the form of OAuth and identity federation, whether that's through Active Directory or social identities. And lastly, I would say another pillar or another goal of the API economy is to create internal agility. And this is something that I'll demonstrate later on in my presentation. So the rise of APIs. We're seeing continued growth in APIs. It's generally fueled by mobility, Internet of Things, big data, and the cloud. Um, you'll often hear this, this term, public APIs are the tip of the iceberg. And the reason for that is you've got the tip that's surfacing above the water, and then you've got this massive mass underneath the water. And I think that represents just how many more millions of APIs are buried within the enterprise and are used in a private fashion. APIs are also the core component for many startups. And let's consider you have a startup. You're maybe building a mobile application. You want to use a map. Chances are you're not going to go build that map. You're going to plug into an API that exists. Perhaps it's Bing, perhaps it's Google, but that's not the core competency. That's not the solution you're trying to deliver, but you know that in order to give a good user experience, you need to embed that functionality. And the quickest way to do that is to consume someone else's API. And lastly, APIs are the driver of innovation within the enterprise. And this was something I ran into while I was um, researching this particular topic, and it really resonated with me. And it's the idea of how powerful APIs are in 2015. So if you think about Uber, the world's largest taxi company owns no taxis. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Yet all of these businesses are widely successful, worth billions of dollars, and what is really their core business? Their core business is about exchanging information. And I think everyone in this room has an interest or a history in integration. And I think this is really create, gives us an opportunity to introduce some of these concepts to the organizations that we work for. So who are some of the, the businesses that use APIs uh, within, their, within their companies? And what I did is I visited some of the popular API management vendors and just looked for some logos, some interesting logos. And I'm sure these are all very recognizable brands, regardless of where you're from. And it just speaks to how many businesses are starting to leverage this new way of interacting with customers and trading partners. So now that we've introduced APIs, let's talk a little bit about API management and what is API management. And I relate API management to that of a, a bouncer or a doorman at a club or a, night, a nightclub or a bar. Now, some bars aren't very busy and therefore don't have any sort of a bouncer. But for the bars that are busy or the nightclubs that are busy, they typically do. And what is the reason for this? It's generally to maintain some order and ensure customers have a good experience. So let's think about what a bouncer is responsible for. So the first being authentication and authorization. The first thing they're going to do when you approach the, the bar is ask you for ID. They want to know if you are who you say you are. Next, they want to authorize that you are able to go into that establishment. So they want to ensure that you are over the legal drinking age. They also want to ensure that you're not on their blacklist to ensure that you haven't been in trouble there before and you know, avoid any future confrontations. The next thing they're responsible for is policy enforcement. So we've all been in a place where someone has probably consumed a little bit too much, had a little too much fun and is being a little bit unruly. 
Well, their job is to ensure that all of the other customers are able to have a good experience, and in some cases, they need to boot people out. Uh, another thing that you'll notice is they typically have a clicker as people are entering the bar or the, the nightclub. And the reason for it is it might be regulatory, there might be a fire code that they have to adhere to, but it also provides analytics to the bar, the bar owner. How many customers did we have last night? How many people came and left? So now there's some insight to the bar manager over you know, how they can improve. Why did so many people leave at 10? Why are so many people coming so late? How do we then change those dynamics to increase revenue? And lastly, customer engagement, promote the club. I think if you've ever been in Las Vegas, you'll have a good idea of what I mean by this, but you know, generally they might be handing out promotional materials to try to entice you to get into the club. So I look at API management no different, right? I have a service, I want people to access it, but I don't want it to be a free-for-all. I want to ensure that my customers have a good experience. So what am I going to do? I'm going to authenticate. I'm going to make sure that if you're calling my service or my API, that you should be allowed to. And then I'm going to authorize you and see, OK, what tier do you fit into? Are you like a free, freemium tier kicking the tires? Or are you a very valuable customer paying a lot of money for my service? And I now want to ensure that you are getting the right access that you need to. Policy enforcement. We want to ensure there's no noisy neighbors. Why is someone consuming too much, degrading my service? Find people that aren't in the right tier, we want to maybe throttle them down and make sure that the people that are consuming our, our service and paying a lot of money for it get a good experience. Analytics, after we've gone out and introduced an API management uh, practice or environment, we want to know that it's providing value. And one way we can do that is through analytics. How many people are going through this quote process and how many people are requesting a quote but not following through with actually executing the quote? We want to understand why. Now we can give that insight back to the business. And lastly, developer engagement. We want to ensure that people are able to sign up for our API in a very efficient manner and it's a good experience. So once again, during the, the research of this presentation, I signed up for Major League Baseball Galleries API. And there I went to programmableweb.com, where there's over 13,000 listings of public APIs. And I decided, well, I've never heard of either one of these, but let's kind of kick the tires and see which one's better. So one had poor documentation. I had to wait for a developer key to be assigned to me. Then on the flip side, the other one had great documentation, had a little console where I could try the API and have my time to first successful call to be very small. And it was overall very pleasant to use. So which one did I decide to use? So you can't just put something out there and expect people to magically consume it. You have to ensure that they have a good experience around it. And lastly, and you're probably wondering why do you have a dog on the screen, but if you've ever seen this on TV where the dog is pivoting between all of these different pylons, you know, it's really around agility. And we want to ensure that we can pivot as the business needs us to pivot and that we're not introducing long development cycles when a change is required. So let's now talk about Azure API management. And I think of this as a life cycle. And these are the four different stages. Let me zoom in a bit. So the first one is around project existing or new services as APIs. Next, as an administrator, we want to publish these APIs to developers, partners, and citizens. Once we've gone ahead and done that, we want to view operational and business insights through analytics. And lastly, we want to start to engage our developers. So for those of you who might be new to API management, you might be wondering or asking yourself, how did Microsoft get into this space? And Microsoft got into the space through acquisition of a company called Epiphany back in October 2013. And this was a fairly common model as other enterprise software vendors also saw the need to provide an API management platform. So we had Intel buying a company called Mashery. We had CAA Technologies buying another company called Layer 7. In addition to some of the other traditional vendors providing API management, including people such as IBM, Tibco, SOA Software, or Akana, MuleSoft, 
and others. Lastly, SAP, feeling the pressure from all of these different acquisitions, uh, signed a partnership with Apigee, another popular API management solution. So there's obviously a bit of a gold rush mentality around APIs and the potential and the promise that they can deliver, but people within the industry are definitely taking notice. So let's get into high-level architecture around Azure API management. And so the idea is that we're going to have existing backend services that we are going to expose. These might be existing on-premise or in the cloud. As an administrator, we're going to configure the API within the API management solution. We're going to configure policies, security. Once we've gone ahead and provisioned that or published it, we now have a proxy that apps can go ahead and call. So if I have a mobile application, I want to consume an API, it's essentially going to be virtualized at the proxy level, and then we're going to see a tunnel to our back end. And as you'll see, we can provide some different policies and perform some different actions as messages enter and exit the proxy. We also have the ability to take advantage of analytics because everything is moving through this funnel. So one thing you might be asking yourself is what about latency? Does this introduce latency? Do I have a significant penalty by doing this? And the answer is no. And we'll also see some other benefits in terms of how this can improve the overall experience for your users as we can use cache by simple configuration that'll actually speed up the entire process end to end. And lastly, we have a developer portal where we can engage new developers and provide them with a key that they can then use on their calls as they route through the proxy. So for those of you on Twitter following the hashtag, Tomaso has been, uh, I guess, publishing uh, his developer portal and enticing people to sign up for it. Uh, this is an example of that process. So I'm not going to get into too much because he'll cover it in his presentation. So if we go ahead and double click, we can take a closer look at some of these capabilities. Now there's quite a few, so I'm not going to uh, dive into them, go through the entire list, but it's things about publishing our API, we have the ability to scale it out and have more instances to deal with demand, we have a monitoring, and then lastly we have, oops, our developer portal where we're going to provide documentation, give an interactive console where people can test and kick, our, kick the tires of our API. So at this point, you're probably thinking, OK, I know BizTalk. We have BizTalk. Why do I need an API management platform? So I figured I'd go ahead and tell a story uh, with the help of Vince Vaughn. So for those of you who do not know him, he's a, an American movie star. He's been in some of those intellectual stimulating movies such as Old School, Wedding Crashers, and The Intern. So last time we checked in with, with Vince Vaughn, he was an intern at a Silicon Valley tech company, and he's now moved on to become a savvy IT manager at an auto insurance company. And in this case, we have a, our business director who wants to take his existing quoting process that typically involves an agent talking, or a customer talking to an agent, and then using all of these back-end systems. And he wants to mobilize his systems and have a mobile app and allow consumers to retrieve auto quotes using their mobile device. He also wants to introduce new channels by allowing different brokerages to use their back end and resell some of the existing services for that insurance company. So naturally, the, the business director, he wants a solution quick. He wants something in six weeks. Vince, knowing that he's this savvy IT manager who has seen this all before, so knows this is impossible. There's just too many silos in IT. There's no way he could get this out in six weeks. And part of the reason is how is he going to deal with security and governance? How is he going to enable enrollment and give visibility into the business so that they can actually capture the return on investment? So naturally, our business directors not too happy with this. You know, after all, his grandson is running Minecraft in the cloud. So how hard can this really be? So Vince reaches out to his hotshot architect. And I'm pretty sure at this point, he's probably on the phone with Michael Stevenson, saying, how do I deal with this? And the idea is, well, we should take a look at API management. And in some cases, we can you know, add this agility layer without even opening up holes in our firewall. So Vince feeling a little bit more comfortable, 
then he might get this to work because he doesn't have to involve the entire IT department, thinks this just might work. And part of the reason for this is that they don't have to rewrite some of their back-end services. So as he presents this at the Architecture Review Board, you know, he can basically check all the boxes and give all of these functionality and deal with all of the architecture constraints within his environment. And lastly, he's able to you know, give the business some analytics. So of course, you know, with the help of API management, this goes live, business director's happy, and you know, he's getting his bonus, so now he's thinking about his new car. So let's take a look at the existing architecture. So in this case, we've got our customer information system, which is Salesforce. We have a policy system where we're going to maintain the different policies for our customers. We have a Department of Motor Vehicle um, service, external service, and part of the, the reason for this service is it's going to maintain the different characteristics of vehicles, such as whether or not one is environmentally friendly or not. And lastly, we've got a rating engine or a quote calculation engine, which is, happens to be the BizTalk rules engine, where we're going to take the outputs of Salesforce, our policy system, the DMV, and come up with a, a quote that we can send back to the customer. And we're using BizTalk to, is basically in a form of service orchestration where it's going to be responsible for these overall processes. And we've got a customer who's going to be talking to an agent uh, through and then use a, an application to talk to the back end. So how would we allow new channels? How would we allow mobility in this type of an architecture? And one approach would be to introduce API management, in this case, Azure API management. So in the existing architecture, we've got XML, RESTful XML being used on the back end. We've got SOAP used to communicate with Salesforce and some of the other systems. But now we're going to introduce JSON and allow mobile applications to talk JSON to API management, and then also our trading partners. And then what we're able to do is use API management as a proxy between these different clients and BizTalk server. Now, one of the goals I had done a, a used this demo earlier, and I was using JSON, and I didn't have any API management. And so one of kind of, as I went through this, is the challenge to myself was I didn't want to touch BizTalk. I didn't want to make a change to BizTalk with the exception of changing the, the pipelines in my receive locations and my SEM ports to being passed through instead of using JSON itself. And I was able to do that um, using some of the capabilities within Azure API management. So let's just get into the demo. So here a mobile application, and it's a Windows 8 C Sharp application, and I've got three different functions. I've got personal information, current policy, and get auto insurance quote. So if I go ahead and click the personal information, at this point I'm going to be making a call and retrieving the details for myself from Salesforce via the API management and BizTalk. Now there's a couple important identifiers here, and that's really the state and the birth date, as those would be rating factors that would factor into how much my quote is. Next, I'm able to see my current policy. And in this case, I'm driving this gas guzzling SUV. It's not considered environmentally friendly by the DMV. And as a result, I'm paying a lot of money. And I'm sick of paying this money, and I'd rather use this insurance money to put towards maybe a nicer car that happens to be environmentally friendly. So I'm going to go ahead and, and look for you know, an auto insurance quote. And maybe I'll buy a car kind of like that, that director in the business. And I'll take a look at the new BMW i8. So now I can go ahead and call the get quote API. And in this case, it's doing all of that surface or service orchestration in the back end. And we find out that we have a price of $34.99. And it happens to be environmentally friendly. So I'm going to go ahead and purchase that particular policy. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and do a post to the API. 
and I'll see that my policy has been successfully updated. So I can go back to my policy and see that it now shows up as being my current vehicle. So let's take a look behind the scenes of what's involved in this. So don't have time to go through the entire BizTalk solution, but in this case, here's the different receive locations. I'm going to go ahead and use the web HTTP adapter, and I've got my different operations. You know, I've got uh, my gets and my posts, and I'm also going to go ahead and use the same sort of URL mapping that Steph Jan demonstrated this morning. Well, that doesn't scale well, but um, in this case, as you can see, I am using pass through receive and pass through transmit. And in this case, what's going to happen is XML messages are going in and outside of BizTalk. So let's now jump into the API management side of the solution. Now, to provision an API management instance, I'm in the Windows Azure portal, so not the preview. I can go click on New, App Services, and then scroll down, click on API Management, and then Create. It's a very simple service to provision. Provide a URL, some subscription, administrative details, and after about 10 to 15 minutes, we'll have an instance provisioned for us. I can go ahead and click the Manage button here. And I'll now, now be an API administrator in my portal. There's a few different concepts here that I want to go through. The first one would be the idea of a product. So in this case, we can kind of think of it as a product almost as a conceptual container for our API. And we're able to then apply different policies at that level. So in this case, I've got a limited, a limited product, which what this means is I'm going to restrict this will be my my freemium tier, where I'm going to allow people to <coughs> kick the tires on my API without taking it down. And I'm going to restrict to do, say, three calls per minute. And that's something I can do within just pure configuration. So from a BizTalk perspective, this would be something that would be pretty difficult to do, and it would involve some custom work. But within API management, it's really just configuration. Uh, the other tier is my unlimited tier. And in this case, this is where you know, I want to put the people that are paying money for my API and ensure that they have a good level of service. So those are the products, and they can share an API. So I'm going to go ahead and declare my API once, but then I'm going to wrap this conceptual container around it where I can add additional policies. So we'll drive down into my API. I have settings where I can provide a description, a name, and the base URL for my backend service. And then what I'm able to do is define different operations. In this case, I've got a customer get, policy get, policy post, and a quote get. So let's take a, a look at a couple of these. In this case, I've got, I'm looking at the customer get. And uh, that's indicated here by the verb. Next, I have the ability to use a template URL rewrite. Now, if you've ever used the web HTTP adapter before and exposed the service as a RESTful service, out of the box, you know you get this service1.svc, which isn't the prettiest thing to deploy. Uh, so we have the ability to change that and make that a little bit more developer friendly. And we can do a mapping between the URL that exists at the API layer and the URL of our backend service. And what the curly braces and zero means is that's really a parameter. And you can see that that is, exists in both the API implementation, but also the backend service. If we go ahead and click on parameters, 
we'll see that this is the name of our parameter. It's an email address. It's a string, and we're able to provide a value. Now, what's interesting about this is we're pre-populating this data, but when we go over to the developer portal, this will be surfaced, and we can actually use this to kick the tires on the API very quickly without a lot of friction. The next one I want to focus on is the post to show you what that looks like. So once again, here's the HTTP verb. Here's the URL that we're going to expose through API management. And here's the backend URL. Now, if you've done REST before, you'll know that GET typically involves query parameters, but a POST wouldn't. A POST would involve sending a, an actual message body. So in this case, we don't actually have any parameters to pass, but we do have a message body. And within the portal, we're able to surface a sample message that will also be able to be used within our developer portal that allows people to once again test out our API. The next area I want to talk about is what's called policies. And we've got three different scopes. We can apply a policy at a product level, and that's how we're going to do rate limiting on basically our limited product. We can do it at the API, so that means the policy will be invoked regardless. And lastly, we can do it at the operation, which is going to be specific to that operation. So if we take a look at the customer get, we'll see our policy definition wizard. And you can see that the API management portal has taken care of the rewrite policy for us when we configured that previously. And this would be on the inbound side. And then we're able to apply a policy on the outbound side. Now, as you recall, we talked about BizTalk wanting to talk XML, but our mobile apps wanting to talk JSON. And in this case, we're going to do an XML to JSON policy, which will take that XML message out of BizTalk and convert it to JSON on the fly. Now, this feels perhaps a touch dirty, but remember, one of my premises was I did not want to touch the BizTalk solution. So as you're familiar with BizTalk, there's the idea of a root node, and you typically have a namespace prefix. And my mobile client is not interested in, the, in that at all. So in this case, I'm going to use a, a simple find and replace, kind of a string manipulation uh, policy to actually do a search for you know, this demo request, sorry, demo response, and replace it with nothing, essentially. And you'll see some funky characters, because these have to be uh, XML encoded. So I could have done this in a pipeline, and this would have been a little bit cleaner, but I also thought some value in doing it this way so you can see another capability of this find and replace policy. Shifting gears to the post. Now in this case, remember, we're sending a message body. So we're going to do a conversion from JSON from the mobile client into XML so that BizTalk can receive an XML document and be happy. And then we're also going to do find and replace around this root node and this namespace prefix, in part due to API Manager wrapping the XML in a document root node. So once again, work that could be done in a pipeline, but I chose to do it here. And let's be honest, this is simpler than creating a custom pipeline component. So that's on the inbound side. On the outbound side, it's going to look similar to the get in the sense that we have XML coming out of BizTalk, and we want to expose it as JSON to our mobile device. So that's policies. And the next area I want to talk about is analytics. So we've got four different tabs. We've got kind of the summary tab where we can kind of choose the, the time frame that we're interested in at today, yesterday, seven days, 30 days, and last 90 days. We can take a look at our usage. And at this point, we have the ability to filter based upon our product, our API, or our operation. Now for demo purposes, let's take a look at get customer. And we can see that I've made up quite a few calls over the past day uh, in preparation of this demo. We'll also see the regions in which this is being called from. Now, in part, I do have a VM in a US, uh, in a US region. So that's why we see the US coming up here. And then naturally, I'm in London, so we're going to see this light up. If I go back to, say, the last 30 days, we'll see a couple more countries light up. 
And now we can see Canada and Brazil also showing on the map. So this is pretty powerful in the sense that this is all out of the box. So if you wanted to know where are my calls coming from, like who's interested in my product, this is not custom stuff that you have to build. This is really out of the box and all configuration based. If we want to look at bandwidth, we can also do that and see based upon the different regions in the world. From an IT or operations perspective, we can check into the health of our particular APIs. And one of those ways is through status codes. Actually, So I can see you know, successful calls and blocked calls. So I'll show you this in a little bit, but really that's around rate limiting. So I'm, someone is calling my API more than they should, and as a result, they're getting an H, or a HTTP status code of 429, which means blocked. Uh, caching, we have the opportunity to see you know, how many cache hits and how many cache misses are occurring. And I'm gonna configure that shortly. And we can also see our response times and our backend service times. And we can see that by geographical region as well. And then the last tab is around activity. So if we want to see you know, who is, which developer or which trading partner is using our API the most, you know, which product is being the most, what is the response time around it, and which APIs are being the most, once again, all out of the box, no TPE, no BAM API that we have to invoke through you know, any sort of logic. This is all out of the box for us. Now, one thing, I'm looking at this, and I'm not super pumped about some of these response times. In fact, we're doing, as a result of some of the service orchestration, we're dipping into these back-end systems. There might be scenarios where we don't actually need to dip into these back-end systems. If we have data that's typically pretty static, perhaps master data, you know, it doesn't change all that often. Why would we go ahead and call all these back-end systems to expose this data to our mobile devices? So in this case, we can actually take advantage of caching. So I'm going to demonstrate this through the developer portal. So here it is here. I can go ahead and find the API I'm interested in. In this case, it's the auto insurance API. I have my different operations on the left-hand side. In this case, I'm going to select get customer. So I can click on open console. I now need to provide that parameter. So this is in Chrome caching this value. This is being surfaced based upon the metadata that I configured as an administrator in the API management portal. So I'm going to go ahead and pass my email address in, which is the email address I used to log in to the mobile app, and I can perform an HTTP GET. And we can see the request took too long. It took 3,000 milliseconds, but I did get a response and life is good. But if this is pretty static data, why would I want to have my user waiting that long if they don't have to? So I can go back to the API management portal as, a, as an administrator. I can choose my API, choose my operation. In this case, it was the get customer. Click on the caching tab, and then simply checking off this checkbox. Now, I can also delimit it if there were certain query parameters that I want to, to cache, but in this case, it's one query parameter, so we're going to cache on that. So I go ahead and I click Save, and now caching is enabled on that particular operation. There's a duration or a TTL that I specify. In this case, it's 3,600 seconds. So that any request that looks exactly the same will be, the response will come from the cache. It won't actually come from the backend system. So in this case, you know, we were at 3,000 milliseconds. Let's go run it again. So it's 2385. Run it again, 36. So it takes a little bit of time for, to go from the admin experience and have that policy pushed into my cache. But now we're talking 36 milliseconds, which is lightning fast. 
and be very, a great experience on a mobile device. So obviously you can't use this when you have a lot of dynamic data, but in situations where you have static data, there's a huge a performance improvement here. And once again, if you were to do this in a BizTalk solution, you're going to be doing this. It's all custom work. Whereas once again, could it be any simpler to enable cache? Probably not. Now, if we want to take a look at that rate limiting solution or situation, we'll go back to the management console. We'll go to the product, or sorry, we'll go to policies. We will choose our product, which in this case is going to be Auto Insurance Limited. And now what I can do is I can drag over a limit rate call policy, or basically click the button, and then go ahead and configure it. So what I can say is limit the number of calls that can be made within a specific time frame. And now this is 60 seconds. So if I call this now three times within 60 seconds, I'm going to get an HTTP status code error of 429. So moving back to the developer portal, we have the notion of subscription keys. Now, me being an administrator on this service, I have two subscription keys. The first one is the unlimited subscription key, which is what I've been using thus far. And now I'm going to switch to the limited API key. So I'm going to go choose that. We're going to use the same operation the customer get. So we'll click that once, we get OK. Click it again, OK. Third time. We're going to get status code of 429, too many requests, and then as part of the payload, we get an indicator of how much longer we have to wait before we can call the service again. <coughs> so once again, if you're going to do this from a BizTalk perspective, this is pretty difficult to do. A lot of custom coding. And on the API management side, it's really just configuration. Just want to summarize what we've seen here. So we've taken you know, a legacy integration scenario, and we've modernized it and introduced new channels. I demonstrated how to provision an API management instance. We talked about the dashboard and analytics, uh, the concepts around products, APIs, operations. I showed you how to test APIs from the developer console. Another thing I didn't get into is how you can actually use client code. I don't know if you noticed, but below the, the, the get button is that there was C Sharp and Java and Python and Ruby. And what Azure will do is actually generate you some some client code so that if you had one of those types of applications, you could embed that in your application and call the API right away. And then we talked about some custom policies. So JSON to XML, XML to JSON, caching, rate limiting, and security. So with that, I'll just leave you with uh, my contact info. And uh, there's no time for questions, but certainly if I'll be around, so uh, come find me at break or after at the end of the day. So thank you.